Mark David Page is going to also be in the parade. Nine of you are three Morning, church. I told some of the folks at Wisconsin Madison that uh, in January. At the Rouse House, I decided I was going to keep track how much rain we got. And we had 7.6 inches in January. Uh, the other night, Kenny was saying, I think the average is like 1.6 or 1.7 right in there. So that's more than four times normal just in January. Um, God has really been turning on the faucet for us of late, hadn't he? Um, I want to mention, um, I am just thrilled with how in a very beautiful, quiet, meaningful way, folks have been redoing the inside of this building. Um, we've been in here now 15 years, 16 years, and uh, you live in a house that long, that house needs to be painted and fixed up and spruced up some. And um, I hope that you will take the time to after service or something, kind of walk around and look at some of the gorgeous work that's been done quietly by connect groups and various individuals here in, in sprucing up various rooms. Most of you, I think, are aware of what's happened in the parlor and in uh, Barrett's youth room. But if you look at the 7th, 8th grade classroom, it's now been reworked. Of course, the nursery just looks great. Um, Guys, don't just go right into the women's restrooms on this side later, okay? But if it's quiet, when you get a chance, they have done a fabulous job of redoing the women's restrooms on this side. They're, it's amazing. And they've also redone the children's Bible hour room, and, and, and it looks great. And so, again, quietly, um, nobody really coordinating the efforts per se to get this done, just people because they love this church and love this house that we meet in sprucing it up are doing a tremendous job and I would just encourage you to just walk around and take a look at some of the beautiful work that's been redone as uh, various parts of this building are being reworked um, I don't know about you I have a feeling I do when it comes to this I am really really frustrated and tired a feeling like I'm constantly lied to. Not by people I know, not by people around here, but in, in, in news that's half told and, and twisted and misrepresented and, and facts that aren't being shared about things. And, and I really am frustrated with the way it's going when it comes to the lack of information or the misinformation that's being shared about things that are shattering and destroying people's lives, like alcohol, like marijuana. Uh, right now, I mean, we hear about opioids all the time, and rightfully so. I mean, opioids are a scourge. But the fact of the matter is, I'm going to show you some numbers here in a little bit. Every year, tens of thousands more people die of alcohol abuse than of opioid abuse. When's the last time you heard about alcohol abuse? It's all about opioids, and I'm not negating that at all, but what I'm telling you is there's a scourge that's killing more people than opioids, and it's alcohol, and nothing is being said. And I really believe that we need to share the truth with each other we need to share the truth desperately with our children and our grandchildren. We need to share the truth with people we know about the dangers of these substances because they are affecting and destroying millions of lives. And so this morning specifically, I want us to look at some truths about alcohol, things you're not going to hear this afternoon on the Super Bowl ads. Okay, when every beer company in the world is going to have their ads on that. You're not going to hear about this, but I want you to. We need to. 
Has anyone ever told you, for instance, that the vast majority of wine consumed by the ancients had less than 4% alcohol content? Well, people in the United you know, they, they, they don't. Yeah, they did. They did. The vast majority of that alcohol was only 2 or 3% alcohol. That's all. Okay? The idea of distilled liquor, distilled spirits, didn't begin to appear until the 8th century AD. And by the way, when they talk about distilled spirits, I didn't even know what that meant for the longest time. Never paid attention. Okay? I thought it meant maybe distilled. You let the sediment settle on the bottom of it. I didn't know. Distilled means an increased alcohol content. Distilling literally means they take the alcohol and they heat it, the liquor, whatever it might be, and they gradually increase the alcohol content to a given point that they want. That is distillation. That's what's taking place when you talk about distilled liquor. It is enhancing the alcohol content of the whiskey or whatever it might be, the vodka, whatever. Alcohol is not a stimulant. A lot of people think it's a stimulant. They treat it like it's a stimulant. It's not. Alcohol is a depressant. And when you abuse it, it destroys two of the most important organs in the human body. It destroys the liver and it destroys the brain. It has a unique chemical makeup, alcohol does. Alcohol, because of its molecular makeup, is able to penetrate the blood-brain barrier and go immediately to the brain in a way the vast majority of drugs are not able to do. It affects the neurotransmitters in the brain. And that's why people get drunk. That's why they stumble. That's why they act weird. We'll talk more about that later because literally, literally, it is destroying brain cells. That's what alcohol does, among other things. Now, how does the body absorb alcohol? Um, this information I took right out of uh, a University of California at Santa Cruz brochure that they hand out to their students warning them about alcohol. And so this is straight out of that information. Once swallowed, a drink enters the stomach and the small intestine where small blood vessels carry it to the bloodstream. Approximately 20% of alcohol is absorbed through the stomach. Most of the remaining 80% is absorbed through the small intestine. Here's the big deal. Alcohol is metabolized by the liver where enzymes break down the alcohol. Understanding the rate of metabolism is critical to understanding the effects of alcohol. In general, the liver can process one ounce of liquor or one standard drink in an hour. I'll contest that just a, just a bit in a second. If you consume more than this, your system becomes saturated and the additional alcohol will accumulate in the blood and body tissues until it can be metabolized. It all has to be metabolized by the liver. So, this is why pounding shots or playing drinking games can result in high blood alcohol concentrations that can last for several hours. Now, what's a drink? I think it's important that we define what a drink is. An average drink contains about six-tenths of an ounce of alcohol. If you have a beer... A 12 ounce can and it's 5% alcohol, that will work out to 6 tenths of an ounce. If you get a drink of malt liquor and you get 8 to 9 ounces of malt liquor, it has approximately a 7% alcohol content that works out to about 6 tenths of an ounce. If you have a 5 ounce glass of table wine, it's about 12% alcohol. Once again, that's about 6 tenths of an ounce. If you take a shot of gin or rum or tequila or vodka or whiskey, a shot is considered to be an ounce and a half. That's about 40% alcohol on average. It can be a lot more than that, but about 40%, that's 80 proof. Whatever the proof is, that's twice the alcohol content. So if it's 120 proof alcohol, uh, alcohol it's 60% it's alcohol, okay? If it's 90 proof, it's 40% it's alcohol. That's how it works. Anyway. Each of those is the equivalent of six-tenths of an ounce of alcohol. Now, here's a chart. I don't know how well you can see it, but 
You know, I hear people say, well, you know, I drink, but I, I never get drunk. The legal definition of being under the influence is when your blood alcohol rate reaches 0.08%. If you blow 0.08% and they stop you, they can charge you for DUI, okay? 0.08%. What that means is, if you look at this chart, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it. You see all those red numbers toward the bottom? All those red numbers indicate that you're drunk. Legally, you're drunk at that point in consumption. On the side, on the left side of the number of drinks it takes, Across the top is your body rate. And again, a drink implies that you have had six-tenths of an ounce of alcohol. What this means is, ladies, if you drink two beers, if you had a beer and a glass of wine at a meal in an hour, you're drunk. You are technically inebriated. Your blood alcohol level is now over 0.08%. I don't care how big you are, I don't care how tough you are, I don't care how strong you are. If you're a guy and you sit down and you just drank three beers, or you had a martini and then you had a glass of wine with your meal, and you followed up with a drink afterwards, you're drunk. Oh, I'm not even, yes you are. You are technically inebriated. It does not take very much alcohol to raise your blood alcohol content to 0.08%. And people kid themselves, well, I ain't drunk. At 0.08%, you are messed up enough, all right, that your reaction time, your judgment, and everything else should preclude you from driving a car. And so this idea, well, you know, yeah, I have a couple of beers with the guys. I have a couple of drinks once in a while, but I don't get drunk. Ah. Technically, legally, oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. And you are impaired. Whether you want to admit it or not, that's the way it is. The safe limit to taking a drink is you take a drink. A drink. And that's it. Okay? There's no inebriation at that point. You go beyond that and you start messing with being inebriated. That's a fact. Undeniable, inarguable. Scientific fact. Now, according to the writer of Proverbs, what can the consumption of alcohol add to your life? You know, I hear people, you constantly hear this, well, why do we have to study the Bible? I mean, he wrote that 3,000 years ago. Who cares about what they thought 3,000 years ago? Because human nature has not changed. Because the problems that we face today aren't a lick different than they were 3,000 years ago when it comes to dealing with addictive things like alcohol and I want, you to, I want you to listen to what the writer of Proverbs says about consuming alcohol. What can it add to your life? He says, first of all, poverty. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Think about something. How many street people are alcoholics. How many people out there on the street and they have nothing? And you see them in Tulsa, you see them in Oklahoma City, you see them in K you go to a big city and you're going to run across them. And the only way those people stay alive is by the grace of a society that provides some kind of a security blank for them and feeds them at shelters during the day and puts them up in the cold at night. They have nothing. Every dime that they panhandle or beg is spent on booze. They're poor. Why are they poor? Because alcohol has destroyed their lives, destroyed their ability to function, to make a living. Estimates of lost production and wages due to alcohol abuse run between $33 billion and $68 billion dollars a year. Break that figure down and figure out how much that costs you every year with those who abuse alcohol. The writer says strife. 
Proverbs 23, 29 and 30. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who want to sample bowls of mixed wine. What does Solomon warn? You want problems? You want trouble? You want strife? Drink. From the U.S. Department of Justice, 40% of all violent crimes have alcohol as a factor. Assault, murder, sexual assault. 44 out of 10 violent crimes have as a direct factor alcohol. How many times have your defendants say, oh, I never would have done that if I hadn't been drinking? No, they probably wouldn't have, but they were. And look what happens over and over and over again. You see, when you drink, one of the first things that goes is the front part of your brain where you reason. And that's why people act stupid. That's why they say stupid things. That's why they do stupid things. Because one of the first things that's affected is your ability to make judgments about things. And so people act in ways they would never act otherwise. 40%. Now that doesn't include, by the way, people intoxicated with other drugs. That's just alcohol. 88,000 people die from alcohol-related causes annually. Alcohol abuse is the third leading cause of preventable death in the United States of America. It kills way more people at this time than the opioid epidemic does. And again, I am not discounting at all the opioid epidemic. What I'm saying is, it's kind of flying under the radar now. They don't want you to know almost 100,000 people a year die because of alcohol and its abuse. One of the first funerals I conducted was for my father-in-law's brother who was shot to death by his girlfriend in a drunken brawl over dog food. They were both drunk and got in a fight over who was going to feed the dog. And drunk, she pulled out a gun and shot him and killed him. How many senseless, stupid, indefensible deaths have occurred because people allowed their reason to be stripped from them by being drunk, by abusing alcohol? Physical complications. Listen to Solomon. Your eyes will see strange sights. And your mind will imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. You can't stand up straight. One of the things they test them for, right? When they pull them out of the car. Can you walk in a straight line? They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. The South Africans did a study of alcohol abuse. And here are a few of the ways in which they would argue that alcohol affects your nervous system. And, and the South African study would be reflective of any study done here in the States as well. Memory impairment. You're killing brain cells. Is it going to affect your memory? It absolutely is. Impaired walking, reaction time, and hand-eye coordination. That's why they don't want, I don't want you driving drunk. I don't want anybody driving drunk. People kill other people driving drunk because they're impaired. Their reaction time, their hand-eye coordination is impaired. It causes sleep disturbances. Uh, it destroys the sleep cycles. People can't get rest like they normally do. It causes behavioral changes, which are pretty obvious. The first time I met my future stepfather-in-law, when I took Carol home, he was drunker than a skunk. And he came out there and he was just in a lovey mood. And I didn't know what to do. He was hugging all over me and he was so glad to see me. And he was just, it was embarrassing. I didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to react. That was not normally Merle Morton. But that was Merle Morton drunk. 
it causes behavioral changes. It causes alcoholic blackouts. People say, I just, I can't remember. And they can't because they've impaired their brain with alcohol. It causes peripheral neuropathy, which means that you begin to have pain in the nerves in your hands and your feet as a result of the damage that you're doing to your central nervous system. Our youngest daughter, Melissa, was married to Peter Hall. Peter was one of the smartest men I've ever known. I'm serious. He was a genius. Peter, Peter could do anything that Peter wanted to do. Um, he could have been a doctor. He could have been a nuclear physicist. Uh, he, chose to go into, he chose to go into the software business. Took a couple of courses, that's all while he was in college, joined a software company, and within a couple of years was one of the top executives in that company because he could just pick it up. He could just pick it up. Peter was an alcoholic. His daddy had been an alcoholic. And Peter became an alcoholic. Now, well, I don't drink during the week, but he binge drank like a lot of alcoholics do. And on the weekend, he would literally drink himself unconscious. And he did that over and over again. And Melissa begged him to get treatment, begged him to stop. When Peter died, he looked like a skeleton. Couldn't hardly even recognize that this was the man that we had known. He had ruined his pancreas was dealing constantly with one of the most painful things you can deal with, and that's pancreatitis. He had destroyed his digestive system. He died alone in a chair in his house, and it was days before anybody found him. Now, here was a man that could have done anything, and we watched alcohol destroy him, destroyed his career, destroyed his marriage, destroyed his life. I went up a few years ago and preached the funeral for a niece of ours. Similar story. Alcohol killed Megan. She wasn't even 30. Killed her. Destroyed her. Destroyed her brain. Destroyed her liver. Destroyed her kidneys. It destroyed her. That's the physical complications that are associated with alcohol. Do I have a real problem with this stuff? Yes, I do. Because I've seen the damage that it's done, the havoc that it wreaks, the death, the needless death that it brings about. Addiction. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Proverbs 23, verse 35, the latter part. There are now an estimated 15 million alcohol abusers in this country. That's not consumers of alcohol. That's people who, on a regular basis, abuse it. And abusing it would mean getting drunk. Okay? Some people binge drink. Other people may drink every day. But there's 15 million alcohol abusers in this country. Do the math. That's 1 in 10 or 1 in 12 adults. Is there a single solitary person here who doesn't know an alcoholic? I mean, we all know an alcoholic. We do. All of us do. Probably more than one. One in five people between the ages of 18 and 30 regularly binge drink. One in five millennials binge drink. That means they're alcoholics. What about social drinking? It's argued the New Testament counsels moderation, not abstention, in the consumption of alcohol. 1 Timothy 3, 3 and 8, the qualities of an elder or deacon not given to drunkenness, not indulging in much wine. Um, it's argued that there are health benefits claimed for the consumption of alcohol. It is a natural depressant. It lowers blood pressure. It can lower cholesterol. My grandma Rouse, her doctor prescribed a teaspoon of brandy for her 
to take every day like medicine. He said it would help her heart. Can alcohol be medicinal? Can it be used in that way? Yes, it can. Is it harmful in that way? No, it's not. But can it be and is it being constantly abused? Is it too available, too dangerous for too many people? There are two undeniable principles you've got to consider with alcohol consumption, I believe, as a Christian. Number one, you have a responsibility to a weaker brother. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Romans 14 verse 15, I would add drinking would apply as well. My right to drink ends the second that I cause a brother to stumble. If there's somebody and they're struggling with alcohol and my influence on them causes them to drink, I have wronged them. When I was living in Portales, I had opportunity to study with and ultimately baptize a man. When I first met him, he was so drunk he didn't even know he was drunk. And I'm not kidding. He called me on the phone, wanted to talk to me. I went over to his motel room where he was staying against my wife's wishes. You don't know what you're getting into, and I didn't. But I wanted to talk to this guy because he wanted to talk to a preacher. And he, again, he was so drunk he didn't even know he was drunk. You know, he got drunk with a priest. A priest had taken him to a bar, and they had gotten drunk together. And then the priest had dropped him off at his motel room. Now, ultimately, we studied and he was baptized into Christ, gave his life to the Lord. But we've got a responsibility. Our rights end where another's weakness begins. Well, that's not fair. I don't care. Call it fair, call it unfair, call it what you want. We have a responsibility to watch out for the weaker brother not give them a cause to stumble. Secondly, I think it's very important that we apply the wise unwise principle. I want you to set right or wrong to one side for a moment, okay? And I'm not saying you should forget right or wrong. Let's just set it aside for a moment. You will never be a drunk if you never drink alcohol. You know, it infuriated me the way they picked at Nancy Reagan because Nancy Reagan started this just say no. Oh, that's so ridiculous. That's so simplistic. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. If you don't use it, it won't hurt you. I will never be addicted to marijuana because I've never smoked it. I'll never have a problem with meth because I've never used it. Or cocaine or heroin. Cigarettes aren't going to kill me because I've never smoked. And I will never be an alcoholic because I'm not going to drink. I have said no, 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 no. And you know what? It protects me from all kinds of things. And it does you too if you do that. Okay, you don't even give it an opportunity. I wish before God that Peter, whose dad was an alcoholic. And by the way, some scientists are now arguing that genetic predisposition may play up to a 40% role in alcoholism. Peter's dad was an alcoholic. And Peter claimed to hate alcohol. And then he started messing with it. And the next thing we knew... It was out of control with him. If he had just said no and never touched the stuff, he'd be alive today. But he didn't say no. Have you ever considered why Timothy was a teetotaler? Paul will tell Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 23, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. He urges him. Timothy, go ahead and drink. Everybody drank wine back then. Timothy didn't. Why not? Well, I believe because earlier, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, Paul had told Timothy, Timothy, I want you to be an example. I want you to be an example in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith, in purity. I want you to be an example. And I believe that one of the conclusions that Timothy had come to was, if I'm going to be an example, I'm going to be a teetotaler. I'm just not going to drink wine. That way I can't cause anybody to stumble. I can't cause any problems for anyone. And so he just flat abstained and didn't drink. And Paul had to tell him, Timothy, you've got some tummy trouble. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Our children have never seen my wife and I take a drink, ever. Every one of them, I think, drank some alcohol at one time or another. Because kids are going to be kids. 
And as we're going to talk about Connect Group tonight, as I'll share with you in the video, you can teach them, you can show them the way, they're going to make their own decisions. You know that. My mom and dad taught me, okay, but I make my own moral decisions. You can set an example, you can show them the way you can, but ultimately they are going to make their own moral decisions. But they cannot say that mom and dad showed them the wrong path. Mom and dad's example didn't match up with what mom and dad taught. And all we can do from this point forward is what we can do anyway. I'm just saying, that we have a tremendous responsibility in our culture, as twisted and perverted as it has become, to do everything that we can to protect our children and to set a proper example for our children. And it is very difficult to get them to walk where you don't want to walk and to try to convince them not to act like you've been acting. We have to set an example. Again, is somebody going to go to hell because they drink a hot toddy? Absolutely not. If somebody has a glass of wine with a meal, I won't do it. But if they want to do it, I'm not going to call it a sin. But I'll tell you this. If they're causing somebody to stumble, it's wrong. And on top of that, if they're doubling up on it, they're messing with drunkenness. And that's forbidden. Brethren, we need to take this seriously. This is killing people. It's destroying. I am sick and tired and have been for a long time of watching people's lives destroyed and nothing being said about this. It's awful. And we need to know the truth and we need to share the truth and live the truth. And the truth about alcohol is but like so many things, it can be a blessing, but abused, it can be a real curse. Please think about this. If we can help you today in your walk with the Lord, in your relationship with him, if you're struggling with things and you need our prayers, you need our aid, or if you've been looking at God's word and you're ready to give your life to him, become his child. If you're ready to be baptized into Christ, if there's any way that we can help you in that walk, won't you come? While we stand and while we sing. Free from the burden of I'm an alcoholic, but I don't drink anymore. My father was an alcoholic. I remember nightmares. 
I was watching my father and his brother-in-law fight, breaking glass, blood, just everywhere. In 1984, I came back to the Lord in this body of believers. My life had been going down. 1984, now it goes up. And it continues to go up because I believe that Jesus, who his stripes, healed me. And you can put anything that is pulling you down in Jesus' healing power. I just had to tell you all that.